Good evening, everyone. So tonight, we're very grateful to have Dr. John McGreevy with us. Dr. McGreevy is the Francis A. McEnany Professor of History at the University of Notre Dame. He joined the faculty there in 1997 and served as the chair of the history department from 2002 until 2008, and then at that point became dean of the College of Arts and Letters. Uh, he remained in that role until 2018. He is the author of several books, the first being Parish Boundaries, the Catholic Encounter with Race in the 20th Century Urban North, the second, Catholicism and American Freedom, and the, his most recent, American Jesuits and the World, How an Embattled Religious Order Made Modern Catholicism Global. And he's currently working on another book, uh, actually a book on global Catholicism, uh, and tonight he's going to be drawing his lecture, at least in part, from the research that has gone into that book. He's also published a number of articles and reviews in the Journal of American History, the New York Review of Books, and the Chronicle of Higher Education, among some others. And then another interesting uh, little detail, he served on the Pulitzer Prize Jury for History in 2010. Uh, so Dr. McGreevy is... Uh, well-renowned in the field, and we're delighted to have him speak to us tonight, aided uh, through the internet, aided by Zoom. So Dr. McGreevy, thanks for joining us. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Uh, thanks to the audience, thanks to Father Endres, who I see as a representative of the wonderful tradition of scholarship and historical inquiry that exists in Cincinnati Catholicism, a topic well worthy of such study. Uh, and I. Uh, feel that my presence here uh, tonight is in some ways uh, a part of that long legacy. Uh, this evening, I'll speak for about 35 minutes and then take questions. I'll draw a bit on material I used in my last book. I'm gonna share my screen now, see if this works. Okay. Let's see, did that work or no? Normal. There we go, I think. Okay. Uh, so that was my last book, American Jesuits in the World, uh, about how European Jesuits came to the United States in the 19th century as part of what historians often call the ultramontane revival and how some US Jesuits went out in the world in the 20th century. My larger project, and this will be detailed in a book that I think will be published by W.W. Norton uh, in 2022, is a one volume history of global Catholicism from the French Revolution to Pope Francis. And so very big picture. And I hope to give you a taste tonight of that as well. In that book, which I'm working on furiously right now, editing, I make an argument about integrating Catholicism into narratives on topics as diverse as the democratic revolutions of the 19th century, decolonization in the Cold War in the 20th century, and changing understandings of sexuality and gender in the 21st. And I hope that all of this attention to Catholicism will give us a more complete grasp of the modern world. I know that you probably in this audience know this, but it's worth just reflecting that the institution in which we're members is quite extraordinary. No institution in the world is as multicultural or multilingual as Roman Catholicism. None touches as many people. The Chinese Communist Party, the European Union, the US military, the International Monetary Fund, all very important but only the Catholic Church includes extended networks of people and institutions in Warsaw, Nairobi, and Mexico City, and Cincinnati, as well as the most isolated regions of the Amazon and the upper reaches of Canada. Only Catholicism can count 1,200,000,000 baptized members, and only a Pope, as Francis did when visiting Manila in 2014, 
can attract 6 million people, perhaps the largest crowd in human history, to attend a single mass in a driving rainstorm. So how do we get at that topic of global Catholicism? I'm gonna organize my talk this evening around four Jesuits. I do this not because I think the Jesuits are the only way uh, to understand global Catholicism, but because they are a worthy way uh, and a topic on which I've done quite a bit of research. The first is gonna be a guy named John Baptist, who's a Swiss Jesuit, kicked out of Switzerland in 1847 because of conflict between liberal nationalists and Catholics, and who ends up in Ellsworth, Maine. The second main character is gonna be a guy named Horacio de la Costa, uh, a Jesuit in Manila, born in 1916, dies in 1977, and who I'm gonna say, just as Father Baptist is part of the 19th century Ultramontane Catholic revival that was so important for Cincinnati and many other places in the world, de la Costa is part of a new vision of Catholic globalization in the 20th century. A third Jesuit, will be Father Uwen Opcom, uh, a prominent novelist. And I'll talk about him at the very end. And a fourth Jesuit we'll say is a mystery guest. And so I have a question mark there, but I'm gonna give you a very big hint. Think of the most famous Jesuit that you know. Okay, Father Baptist. let's imagine it's October 15th, 1854. John Baptist has stopped in Ellsworth Oops, I'm gonna go right here. A tiny shipbuilding town on the coast of Maine to hear confessions. That night, a crowd of 100 men carrying lanterns and torches surrounds the modest home of a Mr. Kent, an Irish immigrant, where Baps was known to be staying. Kent at first denied that Baps was inside. We know he is and we must have him, yelled the mob. Baps crept into the cellar of the home, closing a trap door behind him. Kent, invited the mob to look into the window. The mob would not relent. If you don't produce him, we will burn down your house and roast him alive. Baptist emerged from the cellar to spare an attack on Kent's home. According to one witness, he still hoped that the instincts of humanity would prevail. But in fact, the mob rushed upon him, dragged him one mile down the hill toward the Union River and tied him to a rail. Some in the mob advocated burning Baps alive. The consensus was to tar and feather him, which the mob did after stripping him naked, taking his watch and emptying his wallet. One eyewitness recalled plucking feathers from Baps' body after a search party had found him, then shaving off his hair and eyebrows to remove raining, remaining bits of tar. The next day, Baps said mass in Ellsworth. Fearful that the mob would gather again, he took refuge in the home of one of the leading figures in the town, and the next day hustled on the stagecoach to Bangor, as accounts of the attack began filtering out from Maine into the far corners of the United States and the world. So how do we explain such an odd, disturbing event? First, I'll talk for just a few minutes about John Baptist and his role in the Catholic Revival, and then I'll talk about his opponents and try and place this in the context of 19th century Catholic globalism. First, Baptist. Baptist is born in 1815. I'll go back, I guess, to the little photo of him. In a small Swiss village, he joined the Jesuits at the age of 20. He spent the next decade studying and teaching at the Jesuit boarding school and college in Freiburg, Switzerland, an important center of 19th century Jesuit life. Once enrolled in the college in Freiburg, perhaps to absorb the central intellectual message of the Catholic revival, uh, which was the conviction that modern philosophy and the French Revolution had placed Catholics and modern liberals on opposite sides of an unbridgeable chasm. Now, as I said, Baps was forced to flee Switzerland in 1847, and this was the first of many expulsions of Jesuits, sometimes women religious, uh, sometimes even leading Catholic lay people from Europe and parts of South America during the tense periods of the 19th century when conflicts over schools and marriage and secret associations broke out. The Jesuits were actually expelled from Italy, Germany, France, Spain, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Colombia, and over two dozen countries in the 19th century. In 
Switzerland's case in the 1840s, Swiss naturalists, nationalists denounced the Jesuits in speeches, novels, and poetry. And mobs looted Jesuit residences, defaced church walls, and destroyed Jesuit libraries. Babst, after he fled, after the Swiss Civil War of 1847, made his way to France, and then he made his way to Ellsworth by 1850. At that time, working in Maine, uh, he decided to take two strategies to building a stronger, more cohesive Catholic population. The first, and this was parallel to efforts by Jesuits across the world, not just Jesuits, uh, priests generally and women religious, was to instill basic doctrinal knowledge into populations loosely connected to the institutional church. Repeatedly, Babst worried about the what he called the pathetic state of catechesis among Maine's Catholics, the bulk of whom were famine era Irish immigrants or Quebecois immigrants from French Canadian immigrants from uh, Quebec. He quote, announced publicly that not one child will receive his first communion, end quote, without knowledge of their catechism. And we will refuse the future absolution in the confessional to the parents who neglect the religious instruction of their children. Figures like Babst, who saw themselves as missionaries, set about forming a more explicitly Catholic devotional culture. And again, there are parallels to this all around the world. The first step was the parish mission, which is actually pioneered by Jesuits and Redemptorists in the 18th century. After arriving in a town in Maine on his horse, Babst would typically organize a mission or jubilee, often lasting a full week. And that would include a series of homilies or exhortations, daily mass, and long hours, uh, sometimes seven, eight hours a day for Babst in the confessional. Mission psychology pivoted between a doctrinal severity centered on the horror of sin and everlasting damnation and a practical, even generous piety aimed at persuading Catholics to view the sacraments, especially confession. It's hard to overstate it's important in the importance in the 19th century worldview and the church as their best shield in a bewildering world. We see the severity in Bapp's correspondence. He viewed missions as spiritual weapons for reclaiming a very large number of bad Catholics and converting the occasional quote Protestant or heretic end quote. We also see the generosity uh, in Bapp's insistence that all could be saved that any sin could be remedied in the confessional. And in fact, the Catholic Jesus of the 19th century was more the empathetic sufferer than the judge, more the Jesus of the sacred heart than the wise rabbi or teacher. Babst also focused on other markers of Catholic identity. This seemed especially important since Maine's Catholics lived in what Babst called accurately a nearly exclusively Protestant milieu. Babs conceded that many Protestants were, quote, generally well disposed toward the Catholic religion, but he thought this superficial acceptance made self-conscious markers of Catholic identity all the more important. When he traveled in Maine, for example, Babs made a big point, a conspicuous point of not eating meat on Fridays. He and other Jesuits and some diocesan clergy had a deep and enduring interest in miracles such as lures, which non-Catholics tended to scorn. He carried with him at all times a book on devotion to the Sacred Heart, which I think more than any other single devotion spread around the world in 19th century Catholicism. In fact, at Notre Dame where I'm teaching, I'm in my office right now, there's a Basilica of the Sacred Heart and a statue of the Sacred Heart within about a five minute walk. I'd be surprised if there weren't some parallels at the seminary in Cincinnati. The cumulative effect of Babst efforts and those of, again, other priests, nuns, and lay people to create a more cohesive and orthodox Catholicism was considerable. After a year in Ellsworth, he told his provincial that almost not a single Catholic avoids the parish mission or doesn't attend mass or doesn't receive communion at Easter. The triumph of grace, he wrote, is miraculous. Once a handful of Catholics in a particular town became enthusiastic about the mission, Babst reported, they went from door to door to recruit other great sinners that had not yet repented. 
A group of women in Bangor, where Baptist went after he had to flee Ellsworth, actually wrote the Jesuit for the father general or leader in Rome in 1858 and said, please don't send Father Baptist away from Bangor, although the father general did send him away, but please don't. Our children grew up without a proper knowledge of their faith, and consequently, many of them were Catholics only a name until they met Father Baptist. Okay, the second way in which Baptist exemplified the 19th century revival, the first is developing through the parish mission, this devotional culture. The second way was in his focus on Catholic education and the building of self-consciously Catholic institutions. This took two forms. First, Baps criticized the use of the King James Bible in Ellsworth Tiny Public School. And this dispute is really the dispute that triggered the tarring and feathering in 1854. He thought it was his duty uh, to tell Catholics not ever to use the words of the King James Bible and the differing versions of the Ten Commandments in that Bible in the town's lone public school. He organized a petition to protest the use of the King James Bible, even though his own English was not very good. Remember, he was Swiss and he spoke Sw French and German, read Latin. And he, the school authorities would not listen to Baps to, uh, when he presented them with the uh, petition. We then know he was assimilating to the United States of America because he hired a lawyer, the one Catholic attorney in Ellsworth, to sue the town for requiring use of the King James Bible. The case went all the way to the main Supreme Court and actually had lots of influence around the country and Baps lost because as the main Supreme Court explained, only common texts such as the King James Bible could civilize, quote, and create Republican citizens, quote, out of immigrant populations. Baps also did something else. He founded a Catholic school for local children. I think in a way, that's what he wanted to do all along. He was convinced that no public school could be religiously neutral. The teachers in the public school, Baps complained, think that our children will become Protestants. We must have our own school, despite the endless difficulties that this will present. Okay, that's Babst. Now, why did Ellsworth residents react so violently to Babst? The passions that provoked the attack on Babst were not unique to Maine or even to the United States. And in fact, in my research for this latest book, I find similar disputes about schools and religion and education more broadly everywhere in the 19th century, from Australia to Germany, to Columbia. In Ellsworth, the editor of the local paper was really an anti-Catholic agitator and reprinted articles from papers in Europe and Latin America that had anti-Catholic attacks, he even published a few short stories. He emphasized how threatening he saw Catholics as to the Republican values of Ellsworth and the state of Maine more generally. Now his slashing style did not endear him to Ellsworth leading citizens who thought he was a little bit uncouth, but even these men sympathized with the basic message that Catholicism was inharmonious, unharmonious maybe, with Republican small r traditions. The Methodist minister in the town said that Catholicism is an old worn out institution, is behind the age. The Presbyterian minister said for 50 years, the various Catholic countries of Europe have been annually disgorging upon our shores tens and hundreds of thousands of paupers and criminals. A wave of street orators, I'll, I'll show you this one just for a second. Here's a letter that Baps wrote to his um, superior. This is a letter I found in Rome uh, uh, explaining what happened to him on that night in Ellsworth. You can tell it's in Latin and there's the signature Johannes Baps, Bangor, Maine, US of America. This is just three days after the attack on him. There's Ellsworth. This gives you a sense of how Jesuits ended up in the United States and where they came from over the course of the 19th century. You can see they came from many places and they landed in many places. We think somewhere between 700 and 1,000 Jesuits ultimately were expelled from Europe in the 19th century and went to the United States. You could make a similar map about expulsions uh, that would go to South America primarily Brazil and Argentina. So I mentioned that uh, there was an anti-Catholic editor in Ellsworth. 
There were also anti-Catholic speakers who came through town. Even Tiny Ellsworth, it turned out, could attract somebody like this guy, Alessandro Gavazze, who was one of the leaders of the revolutions that were became anti-Catholic in character in, in Italy in 1848. Um, after those failed, uh, he left Italy. He then left the priesthood. He was originally a theatine priest uh, and toured Scotland, England, Canada, and the United States, declaiming against Catholic influence. And he actually came uh, to Ellsworth. It is the Bible alone, Gavazze said in Ellsworth, uh, that the American people will flourish. And I would say to them, remember, it was the Bible, the Bible, which made your freedom. Gavazzi thought Jesuit exiles such as Baptist seemed an obvious threat to American liberty, and he urged them to consider expelling the Jesuits from their country. Also joined this conversation, even in Ellsworth with Boston's Theodore Parker, uh, probably the most prominent liberal Protestant minister in the country in the 1850s. He lectured in Ellsworth just a few months before the attack on Baptist. Jesuits, he warned, come in abundance, some are known, Others stealthily prowl about the land, all the more dangerous in their disguise. <clears throat> he concluded, the Catholic Church opposes everything which favors democracy and the natural rights of man. It hates our free speeches, our free pests, and above all, our free schools. Now, Bapst, after the tarring and feathering, continued to work as an administrator and parish priest in cities uh, along the eastern seaboard, including Boston College. His name entered Catholic textbooks as a victim of intolerance. In his old age, he grew a long white beard fit for a patriarch. An account circulated his ability to heal the sick through his prayers or even predict the future. During his last years, he fell into dementia uh, and he struggled to distinguish, quote, between dream and reality, end quote, occasionally waking up in horror as he replayed that night in Ellsworth so long ago. Now, Bapp's story allows us to see the formation in the 19th century of two global milieus. One is Protestant or post-Protestant and increasingly concerned about individual liberty. Another, Jesuits especially, but also Catholics more generally, came out of the 19th century more convinced than ever that they needed to foster communal solidarity. They mobilized around mission campaigns, which carried at once a sense of the church as distinct from Protestant denominations, and they developed a determination to bind Catholics through sacraments, parish associations, and schools to a global church. Some of the Jesuits that Baps knew as European exiles in the United States or who, uh, with whom he had trained in Switzerland took a leading role in the promulgation of papal infallibility in 1870 an event that starkly contrasted liberal understandings of national loyalty and autonomy with a Catholic focus on an independent religious authority. Crucially, Babst and his peers were not multiculturalists. They did not share our sensitivity toward enculturation and their architectural drawings, devotional practices and Latin textbooks conceded little to local context. Their attacks on modernity and their hesitations about both democracy and religious liberty did not prepare them for some of the challenges posed by the 20th century. All of this is 19th century ultramontane globalism. Oops, sorry. Now let's think a little bit about 20th century Catholic globalism, and let's do so through a very different figure, this guy, Horacio de la Costa. Born in Manila in 1916, de la Costa graduated from the country's most elite Jesuit high school in, uh, in the early 1930s. He immediately entered the Jesuits after his graduation. During World War II, he was interned by the Japanese who occupied Manila and the Philippines more generally. Right after World War II, he was sent by the Jesuits to get a PhD in history at Harvard. If Bapp's life intersected with the Catholic revival of the 19th century, 
mass European migration and the development of a Catholic milieu around the world, De La Costa's life intersected most profoundly with one of the great events of the 20th century, decolonization. Filipino independence from the United States, Indonesian independence from the Dutch, Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese independence from France, and independence from France and Britain for two dozen nations in Africa, all within about a 15 year period after World War II, all that didn't move to a single tempo. For the first time though, Catholics from the colonies, indigenous Catholics, often trained in Europe and North America, made their voices heard about what global Catholicism should look like. De La Costa became a leader in the Filipino Jesuits. And in fact, the Jesuits in the Philippines had been first led by Spanish Jesuits up until the 1920s, then American Jesuits into the 1950s. American Jesuits took over primarily after the, the Spanish-American War in the early 20th century. And De La Costa became the first Filipino leader of the Jesuits in the Philippines in the 1950s. I said he was a historian, he became a quite accomplished author. Uh, and he wrote mostly about the 16th century, that is the very colonial origins uh, of, of Filipino culture. But even writing in the 16th century, his theme was really one of the 20th century, the origins of a specifically Filipino nationalist consciousness. He wanted Catholicism in the 20th century not to be a European import, but to be seen as fully Filipino. He insisted, quote, that Catholicism belongs fully as much to Asia as to Europe. His life should be read in parallel with a generation of other Catholics who convert to Catholicism, whose families are Catholic in the early 20th century and in the global South and who become important voices within the church in the 1950s and 1960s in the context of decolonization. One of these would be No Jin Jem, uh, the Catholic leader and then his bishop brother in South Vietnam. Another would be Leopold Senghor, uh, the uh, Senegal um, Catholic writer who writes on what he called negritude, who becomes the first president of Senegal in 1960. This more enculturated global South focused vision of Catholicism became visible at the Second Vatican Council. The first significant act of the council, after all, was to allow the liturgy in the vernacular, in Swahili and Spanish, as well as Latin. And we now know that bishops from the global south voted and spoke loudly in support of this decision. As a group, they saw Latin as less of a unifying vocabulary and more of an imposition. Karl Rahner, a German Jesuit, famous theologian, uh, you know, later wrote that the Second Vatican Council, especially the debate on the liturgy, signified the emergence of a world church in a fully official way. In the 19th century, Rahner wrote, the church exported a European religion as a commodity it did not really want to change. Together with the rest of the culture and civilization, it considers superior. Vatican II, Rahner said, was different. After all, the liturgy had been translated in the vernacular. After all, for the first time in the history of the church, bishops from Spain and Japan and uh, uh, Brazil jostled for time at the microphone and got to know each other in the aula at St. Peter's. A world church could be seen emerging. De La Costa, after the council, became a leader in the church in the Philippines and a leader in the global Jesuits. He emphasized the importance of enculturation in the Philippines, not just in the liturgy, uh, liturgy rather, but in how the church uh, acted uh, in the Philippines. Within the Jesuits, he emphasized the importance of liberation theology. He was very interested in it, as well as uh, reorienting the global Jesuits toward a focus on social justice and slightly away from a more traditional focus on charity. Now, since the council, Rome has become even more of a genuinely global Catholic hub. 
where orthodoxy is defined in curial offices, jostles against the lib realities of pleas for expanded leadership roles for women in the North and South Atlantic, competition with Pentecostalism in Mexico, South America, and the Philippines, and tension with Islam in Africa and South Asia. In the middle of the 20th century, just to stick with the Jesuits for a second, the single largest group of Jesuits came from the United States. Since the 1980s, the single largest group has come from South Asia. There's a photo of Vatican II, still quite remarkable. Now here was my mystery guest. The most famous of the world's Jesuits is now the most famous Catholic of all, Jorge Bergoglio or Pope Francis, an Argentine Jesuit born of Italian immigrants in that last phase of European Catholic migration in the early 20th century, who is not only the first Jesuit Pope, but the first modern Pope from outside Europe, or as he explained on the night of his election, a Pope from the end of the earth. Francis repeatedly invokes as models those Catholics willing to immerse themselves in the culture of people distant from themselves. He has installed an informal cabinet of seven cardinals representing seven continents. When he speaks of a globalization of indifference, marking the current divide between rich and poor, a divide now shaped by the environment and climate change, he pushes Catholic social thought beyond the nation state. Francis recognizes that the demographic future of the church, as I'm sure you know well in Cincinnati, is in the global south. In 1900, two thirds of Catholics lived in Europe. In 2020, two thirds of Catholics live in the global south. The largest number of Catholics are still in Latin America, but as you know, the fastest growing population of Catholics, indeed the one region in the world where the Catholic population is growing quite dramatically, is in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the Catholic population expanded at double the rate of the overall Catholic population, the overall African population between 1950 and 2000. Already there are 230 million African Catholics or about one sixth of all Catholics in the world. The most controversial moments of Francis's papacy have involved synods in which he convened bishops, clergy, nuns, and lay people to discuss various issues. Maybe the most controversial of all was the Amazon Synod, where Francis uh, seems willing uh, to consider married male clergy in the Amazon, or even support a distinctive Amazonian liturgical rite along the, along the lines of the Zairean Catholic rite that was approved in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council. As you probably know, some Catholic traditionalists um, are so uh, disturbed by this phenomenon, what they would view as too much multiculturalism in the 20th century, 21st century, uh, that they often verge on rejection of the Second Vatican Council itself. Now, whether this more synodal church, uh, as Francis convenes synods to talk about particular issues, will tackle fundamental and internal questions, such as the role of women and how bishops are selected is unclear. There are national synods underway in Australia and Germany that touch on these matters. What does seem clear is that Francis desperately desires a more outward facing, less self-referential church. He has long urged Catholics in Latin America to think of themselves as sharing a regional identity. He admires the founders of the European Union who themselves were all Catholics and who insisted in the um, horrific aftermath of World War II of building new forms of collective governance. When Francis went into the center of St. Peter's Square during the first phase of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and he stood in white, he captivated the world. He wrote, the Good Samaritan parable, this is what he spoke of then and then the latest encyclical, speaks to us of an essential and often forgotten aspect of our common humanity. We were created for a fulfillment that can only be found in love. We cannot be indifferent to suffering. We cannot allow anyone to go through life as an outcast. Indeed, we should feel indignant, challenged to emerge from our comfortable isolation and to be changed by our contact with human suffering. That is the meaning of globalism. Now, how Catholics will interpret the Good Samaritan parable and the current situation is an open question. My final person here, my fourth Jesuit, 
is a father, Uwem Akpam. He's a Nigerian Jesuit whose grandfather converted to Catholicism uh, in the 1940s. His stories reveal the world through the eyes of children. He's a fiction writer. One scrambles to survive in a Kenyan slum and hopes to celebrate a modest Christmas. Another makes a dangerous journey through Catholic and Muslim regions of Nigeria. A third clutches the family crucifix while evading warring mobs in Rwanda. I think fiction allows us to sit for a while, he told one interviewer, with people we would rather not meet. Opcom's focus on the vulnerable people of a continent in turmoil rests upon his Catholicism. He often references the first line of Gaudium et Spes, the last document of the Second Vatican Council on the, church, the relationship of the church with the modern world and his famous first line, that the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the people of our time, especially of those who are poor or afflicted, are the joys and hopes, the grief and anguish of the followers of Christ as well. So in the 19th century, in the aftermath of the French Revolution, European Catholics such as John Baptist brought the devotional objects, textbooks, architectural drawings of an ultramontane Catholicism to almost every corner of the globe. At the Second Vatican Council, Catholics from around the world, but perhaps especially for the first time claiming a voice, Catholics from the global south, developed a different version of enculturation and what a global church might mean. What will the next 60 years bring? If Father Opcom's impatience with abstract theology, he has an essay declaring that impatience, is a hint, some of the disputes now animating Catholics in Cincinnati and South Bend and around the world may dissipate less because of unanticipated resolutions and more because the world and the church will have moved on. A new generation may be more receptive to Francis's call to be, yes, citizens of our respective nations, but also citizens of the entire world, builders of a new social bond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGreevy. And um, so we're gonna have an opportunity here for some questions. I'll direct uh, those that are here present uh, to the corner microphone. You can stand right there at the microphone and talk right towards uh, the microphone and the camera and he should be able to pick you up. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGreevy, for your uh, presentation. I'm Father Anthony Brausch. I'm the rector of the seminary here. So thank you very much for being with us this evening. My question would simply be, um, I believe it was Francois Mitterrand who remarked at the formation of the EU that Europe might soon find out just how tribal Europe actually is. So he was something of a skeptic mm -hmm. along the lines of this uh, ability to think of ourselves in this more globalized or a citizen of a more um, globalized entity. So I'm just wondering if you could uh, reflect on those maybe historical forces that your research has uncovered in terms of moving against that or a transposition of nationalism mm -hmm. into other veins that are going to uh, maybe uh, pose a challenge to the, the movements that you've outlined um, this evening. Such a good question. Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful for it. And it's certainly true that there is reaction against globalization. And if we think about Catholics, the Catholics that we know don't live in global Catholicism. They live in particular parishes, in particular places. My more modest point historically is that we can see a Catholic globalization in the 19th century the same disputes animating Catholics in Australia and Poland and Spain and 
if there's anything I've learned in my research, it's, it's just how extraordinary that was as devotional objects, architectural drawings, everything trans go, goes around the world. We can see that uh, in the 19th century and we can see it in the 20th century. I mentioned uh, De La Costa and a different version of Catholic globalization. And I think we see it even more profoundly now. The European Union is maybe not a great example because it has struggled in many ways over the last 50 years, but it's still a mechanism of governance and common currency uh, and shared diplomatic and military ventures that wouldn't have been conceivable in the Europe of 1945. Francois Mitterrand is right that one thing you learn about the European Union, if you study it even a little bit, is that there are national differences. But in a continent that was convulsed by the two most brutal wars in, in human history in the 20th century, we're in some ways living through a long peace since 1945. I don't want to exaggerate that. Look at the Ukraine or other places, but in some ways a long peace. And the European Union and mechanisms of collective governance have something to do with it. And Pope Francis would say, and I would agree, it's worth remembering that it was Catholics at the very beginning who helped found the European Union because Catholics shattered by the experience of World War II were maybe especially inclined to think about governance mechanisms beyond the nation state. So Dr. McGreevy, as um, I was listening to you talk about the importance of the global South and especially uh, the increased presence of Catholics in Sub-Saharan Africa, it just occurred to me that, you know, as national conferences, synods or whatever, um, do their work, you know, to touch on um, issues of concern to their own localities, that that might not always be in keeping with what the global South, you know,'s uh, perspective might be, you know, at least anecdotally, I've heard things about, you know, the global South being a little bit more traditional, maybe in terms of some social questions, some yeah. moral questions. And I'm wondering, do you think this is setting up, you know, kind of a, a an eventual conflict? So uh, I would agree, you know, just as a global South, um, the last family vacation our family took, we have four kids, was to, uh, my parents rent two late cabins for a week, in rural Minnesota and my sisters and I and their kids go there. And we've done this a number of different years. And so this was the, the summer of 2019, you know, the kind of last family vacation. And we always go to mass at this little church um, uh, near Detroit Lakes, Minnesota. And we go to mass there and the priest is from Goa. And that struck me, I'm sure there are examples of like that in Cincinnati of priests from around the world landing in Cincinnati. So two observations to make. One is that you're right. You wonder if the National Synod will be the mechanism of the future since nations are permeable. And there are lots of people who are Catholics in the United States who are not born in the United States or maybe aren't even US citizens. Second, what will synods and genu genuine discussion about contested issues, which you know, to be fair, it was pretty much closed off uh, during the papacies of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. You know, that kind of debate was closed off. What will that mean? I think you're right that the church of the 21st century will probably be more politically, economically liberal. So focused on social justice, economic redistribution, um, other issues of concern in the global south, environment, the effect of uh, climate change on sustainability, or climate change on you know, floods and everything else, and potentially somewhat more conservative on hotly contested gender and sexuality issues. So you know, anyone with experience with the Catholic Church in Kenya, um, the, you know, pastoral treatment of gays and lesbians is not at the top of the to-do list uh, in Kenya. Um, I think the role of women and women's roles may be surprisingly powerful in the global South as well as in the global North. But you're right. 
it could end up being a somewhat more conservative church in the 21st century as people from the global south get more of a voice on some of the contested what i would call gender sexuality issues sure thank you mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Dr. McGreevy, for your talk so far. Uh, my name is Anthony Sanitato. I'm a second theologian here. And uh, it sounds like you've done a lot of research so far in your life. Hopefully, you found your heart inflamed, just like the beauty of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I was just curious what advice you might have for us as men in formation, uh, hoping to one day go out on mission. Uh, yeah, what you maybe would like to share with us regarding just some advice. Well, you know, uh, thank you, Anthony. Anthony, before you go, though, stay up there. Um, <laughs> what what struck you? What struck you about the talk as interesting or controversial, or you wish you knew more of? I loved the aspect of yeah, the universality of the Catholic Church. I mean, you go from uh, um, uh, the earliest priest there you mentioned from Switzerland, yeah. then the Philippines to Africa mm -hmm. and thinking just the way in which, uh, we're all on the same team at the end of the day for yeah. hopefully, uh, bring in the good news, the gospel to others, yeah. but also thinking just so we might easily lose the global mindset, you know, just stuck, uh, under, you know, the American mindset. Yeah. Particularly, I think with individualism, like you mentioned, uh, ba Father Baps. Yeah. Having, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, with not having spent much time in Africa, for example, it sounds like there's a uh, different mindset operating and the church is blossoming there. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a great comment. Um, so American Catholics are about 5%, 6% of the world's Catholics. And it's worth remembering that, that the things that seem hugely pressing to American Catholics don't always seem as pressing around the world. And that is the church that you're going to enter. A couple specific things. Um, I think you will go to a more multicultural parish, even if you stay in Cincinnati and its suburbs, than your predecessors, the men who are ordained in the 1970s. Um, almost, I think that's almost without exception. Um, now more of those parishes will be struggling uh, in terms of finances and membership, but they will also be more multicultural in terms of you know, Latinos in particular, but even beyond that. And that will be a wonderful challenge and opportunity uh, for your parish ministry. And the second, thing I think is, you know, it'll be interesting. We're at 60, we are now entering the post, post Vatican II era. Uh, when Benedict XVI dies, and I'm not eager for that to happen, but when that happens, he's 94. He's the last major actor at the Second Vatican Council who's still alive. And that council has now been received for 60 years in a particular way it'll be interesting to see what the next 60 years bring. I'm not really sure what will happen, but we are, I think, entering something fundamentally new in both the church and American politics and the kind of global culture. And so it could be both exciting and turbulent. So that would, that's a, two predictions. One is the world you're gonna enter is less American, more multicultural than the world of your predecessors. And two, we're at a volatile moment in both church and society. And um, historians sometimes say they wish people you would live in interesting times. I don't have to worry about that for you. Whatever, wherever your ministry takes you, it's going to be very interesting. Thank you for yeah, a piece of information to keep in mind. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. McGreevy, for your presentation. My name is Aaron Huber. I'm a seminarian here in third theology. 
I was wondering if you could touch on a little bit of a distinction between the American notion of tolerance and the Catholic understanding of globalization, because in America, obviously, today in, in modern society, we have this notion of tolerance. Mm -hmm. But I was struck by your numbers from the conversion rate in Africa, mm -hmm. um, where based on my understanding and the conversations, which uh, I've had with some friends from Nigeria, I've talked about the certain tribalism and intolerance that they have there with different communities, how that can be... Um, I guess, put aside while evangelization can still take place, but America seems to really pride itself on tolerance, but our numbers are minimal. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could kind of touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So uh, I might, uh, it's a really good question. I might frame it slightly differently and say one of the great historical puzzles of the last, let's say, 70 years is why has the church, Catholic church in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, not all of Africa, broadly grown so rapidly? And why has the church in much of the developed world, certainly Western Europe, parts of Eastern Europe, parts of Latin America, parts of significant parts of North America, shrunk? Why has that declined in vibrancy? So, Super interesting historical puzzle. And if anyone's interested in that, we don't know the answer yet. You know, I don't think we really have a good answer. In Africa, everyone predicted in the 1960s when African nations became independent, well, that'll be the end of Protestant and Catholic Christianity because it really came to Africa through imperialism, which isn't quite right, but isn't quite wrong either. And as imperial empires crumble, as the French and the British and the Portuguese leave Africa, and the Belgians <coughs> leave Africa, and sometimes they leave it in a shambles, then Africans will develop their own religious traditions. Well, what in fact happened was Africans embraced both Protestant and Catholic, although often a kind of Pentecostal version of both, Christianity with much greater fervor after the colonial powers had left even than they had before. And I don't have, and I don't have in the book I'm developing, a great answer for that, but that is a super interesting and fundamental historical question for the 21st century, is why did the energy in Christianity move toward the South? Okay, that's point one. Point two is why the decline in Catholic observance and Protestant observance after the 1960s. And a lot of people are studying this. And, and there's no simple answer here either. It's not simply to say, um, you know, the, 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 well, there are lots of interesting explanations. One explanation is the churches became too tolerant and too liberal, and that didn't attract people. And the most committed, strong, conservative churches attracted more people that seems less true than it did 20 years ago. Broadly, it probably does have something to do with gender uh, and the emergence of women in their workforce. In the Catholic case, a kind of reaction against the absence of women in leadership positions. That's certainly uh, the reaction against Humani Vitae, the birth control encyclical. That's certainly part of the explanation, but we don't have a full explanation for that either. So I would just say, there's a lot of work to be done, but those two facts, why such growth in sub-Saharan Africa, why significant decline in much of the developed world, we've got to figure out a narrative that takes both into account. Thank you. Mm Well, thank you very much, Dr. McGreevy. We're happy to have you join us this evening and uh, certainly hear this perspective on the emergence of the global church from the 19th century to today. So thank you. Well, what a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, it's been a great honor. <laughs>